go ahead and go ahead and get going. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Tim Bufkin. I'm the national sales manager for broadband at NCAB. Uh, today we're doing a, it's an encore uh, presentation of my Fiber to the Home 101 webinar that uh, that I hosted a few months back. Um, so again, yeah, thanks for if this is your first time catching this or second time. Again, thank you for joining. Uh, thanks for the support. Uh, just a couple couple notes to uh, to start out with. Um, this webinar is RCEP compliant, uh, so we've gone through the standards uh, to meet the the requirements for RCEP. So you can earn credit uh, upon completing the webinar, and then afterwards you'll get an email uh, with a link if you want to go in and take a quiz, uh, so you can finish the requirements for this. Um, and just as a disclaimer. Just because we meet the requirements for RCEP doesn't mean that they necessarily approve or endorse anything here. Uh, these are just the requirements set forth by them. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about some of the just the basic concepts of fiber to the home, you know, especially as it uh, as it relates to more of a rural broadband deployment, utility broadband deployment. Um, so we're going to look at some of the the main differences between running ADSS cable in the in the distribution power space. Uh, versus looking at going to more of a strain and lash approach in the comm space. Um, also going to look at some of the different applications for just cable placement above grade, below grade. Um, and then I was going to talk about some GPON architecture as well. Yeah, look at some of the differences between a centralized split and a, and a distributed split architecture and really just kind of look at the, the pros and cons of a lot of these concepts. Um, so in terms of the yeah you know, the webinar rules, um, the presentation itself is going to last uh, about 50, 50 minutes to an hour. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it under that. After the presentation, uh, we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, if you use the uh, the chat feature during the presentation, um, that's what I'll be using to go and answer any questions. Uh, and of course, we do just ask keep the questions related just strictly to this presentation. If you have any business uh, that specifically relates to, relates to in cab and your company, let's you know, please we just ask we keep that online or offline. Excuse me. So that said, uh, you know when it comes to fiber to the home, you know really one of the the first decisions that we've got to figure out is where are we going to put the cable. You know again, if we're looking at a lot of the if the rural builds that are happening, you know if you're getting a lot of utilities uh, and a lot of electric utilities, electric cooperatives, municipalities that are getting into the fiber to the home business. Uh, so, you know, where are you going to put the cable? Uh, you know, the most common, and especially from an electric utility standpoint, what you're going to see is, is running ADSS cable in the supplier region. So with there, you know, you can either run it in, in the neutral, above the neutral, or below the neutral. Now, in terms of just placed on the power pole, you're going to have to keep this cable at a minimum of 30 inches above the top communication cable. Now, another thing to keep uh, keep in note here is you have a lot of NESC guidelines that have to do with you know where you can run ADSS, um, you know the the distances between you know your your lowest conductor and and the cable or the you know the lowest conductor and how it relates to your ADSS cable and then that distance between there and the comm region. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, so really, just for the core, yeah, you know, for the sake of this presentation. Um, you know, we're going to keep these concepts just kind of pretty, you know, pretty vanilla. Next, you know, we look at either running an ADSS or going a strain and lash approach in the comm region. Um, down here, you know, this is going to be where a lot of your, uh, you know, traditional telco companies have been operating for a long time. Um, so you're, you're going to be much lower on the pole. You're typically going to see at minimum 12 inches in between comm cables. So that's going to be important, you know, when you're looking at what type of enclosure that you want to use, um, you know, how how much have you added on to that cable? Because again, you, you're going to be very strictly confined to that 12 inch space. But also you've got to at least be 40 inches below the power region. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of things that go that you have to take into account you know, as you're looking <clears throat> at these options. And then lastly, cable underground. Uh, yeah, there's going to be areas in your network that you are just not going to be able to be above grade, <clears throat> you know, whether it's in a, a neighborhood um, or sometimes you you might have a city or a muni that has restrictions on what can and cannot be overhead and you know, versus having to keep everything below ground. So we'll also look into some of our options there. 
Um, just kind of a, a quick overview. You know, when we're looking at cable design, uh, different cable designs, you know, we mentioned going above the neutral. For the sake of ADSS, if you're above the neutral, and then really when you start hitting a certain KV value, you're going to want to look at ADSS cabling that has a track resistant jacketing. Now, I'm not going to go too much into that in detail, as again, there's, you know, you can get very technical here, but something to keep in mind that depending on how close you are to conductors, you may have to look at a track resistant jacketing. Typically, though, what most, especially the fiber to the home build uh, in that scenario, most of what you're going to see is going to be just a standard ADSS. And then, of course, when we look at either a strain and lash or going below grade, a lot of times what you're going to see there is either an armored cable with corrugated steel tape or just a plain dielectric loose tube cable, or as we refer to as an, an in-duct cable. So we look at the pros and cons of going with ADSS in the supply region. Obviously, you have to be the one that owns the poles to be able to get into this area or at least work with the electric utility that does. Now, if you're the if you are the electric utility that is building a fiber to the home network, um, this by far is going to be the most cost effective option, mainly because you can design the cable and the hardware to match your current pole setup, which is going to greatly reduce the make ready cost associated with the project. Also, don't have to worry about grounding because that ADSS cable, it's an all dielectric self-supporting design. So you have no metals or anything in there that can conduct electricity. The other thing that I like about it is you know, you're the utility, you own the poles. You are going to be the only one that can get in that space. So you're not competing for space with other you know, traditional telcos, telephone companies, other internet companies that might already be in your area. You're not competing with them. Also, ADSS is a, just generally a very low maintenance solution. If you design the cable correctly and you pick the correct hardware and you set everything up the way that you need, you know, barring just, you know, weather events, tornadoes, bad storms, right, things that are going to damage anything that's on the pole. But, you know, all things equal, that cable is going to last a long time. It's going to take very little maintenance, which, again, just reduces cost. The other thing is with the installation here, it's very similar to installing a conductor. So your power crews are going to be able to adapt very easily to running that cable, you know, across your poles. On the flip side to that, though, you know, in the for the sake of a fiber to the home network, you, know, you are going to have to send guys up there that do understand splicing fiber that can work in splice enclosures. So you do have to use crews that are, you know, either power utility crews or their telecom crews that are certified to get up into that supply region. So that may limit, you know, the pool of splicers and the, the, the pool of workers that you can choose from. And again, obviously, you know, right now, this this industry is booming so much. Yeah, that's that's definitely going to be something to take into consideration. Now, because this cable is not armored, uh, you know, it's just traditionally the, you know, your uh, supporting your strength member is going to be aramid yarn. The cable is going to be vulnerable to shotgun damage, to squirrels. Uh, I don't know how many guys I've talked to that are just constantly, constantly complaining about all the damage that squirrels can do to their cable. And, and it is a real issue. Lastly, again, you know, we talk about designing the cable. That's because you are going to get sag out of the cable. You're going to get movement out of the cable due to ice, due to wind. So you are going to need to design a cable that specifically meets your needs versus you know going and you know, called a getting an off the shelf cable that's going to be more commonly stocked than not. Now, again, talking about the hardware, because this is all going to get engineered together specifically for your application. So when we talk about cable hardware with ADSS, the most critical items we're going to look at are going to be dead ends, suspensions, and motion control. Now, when we're looking at dead ends, the a couple of the main factors that you're going to look at are going to be your max span length, which is going to be similar to the cable, your max span length in between poles. Uh, we're also going to look at the max loaded tension, and then whether or not this is a track resistant cable that we are using now one thing to keep in mind and one thing that at least that we do recommend on our end is you want to match the max loaded tension of the dead end with the max loaded tension of the cable itself so if you have a cable that is a you know call it it's a it's a 600 foot span but it's rated for a 3500 pound max loaded tension while your limited tension dead end here that's rated for 600 feet 
may seem like it could work. It's one of the things that I'd rather go the safer route and make sure that both the dead end and the cable are matched up. Um, I use the comparison of a of a handhold, right? A vault that's going to go below ground. If you have a box that is rated for 22,500 pounds, but you have a lid that's rated for 33,000 pounds, it's kind of like, what's the point? Yeah, if you put a load of 33,000 pounds on that lid, sure, the lid might hold up, but the box is going to crumble underneath it. So just want to make sure that, that you match those numbers up and, and you pay a little bit more attention to that max loaded tension. Next, we're going to be the supports. What we're typically going to see more in a fiber to the home application is going to be a support versus a suspension. So again, some of the main things here, you know, we're going to look at the max span length. Um, you know, it, technically you can use supports as a stringing block. Technically you can. Uh, I'm, you know, I think I, I tend to lean more on the side of caution and not use these because you do, still do have the potential for damaging the cable as you're as you're installing it by using the supports. Again, yeah, you know, if they are advertised that they can be used for that. Uh, but again, from a, a safety and a durability and longevity standpoint of the network, um, yeah, something we again just kind of tend to recommend to steer away from if you can. What I like about the supports though is that in terms of you know fiber to the home network, you know, what you need today might not be what you need 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. So you do have the ability to stack the supports thus allowing for more growth now you know in the case, especially in the case of if you look at the, the the support on the right in this particular case this uh product you can use different grommets that support different size cables and you can even use grommets that can support multiple drop cables within a single port you know so in, in one case you could have three adss cables and six drop cables all running through there on a side note, one thing to at least pay attention is when you start combining drop cables and standard ADSS cables, is you're going to want to look at the the sag rates of the cables and make sure that you know you don't have cables that are possibly getting crossed up because of different uh, different sag rates. So again, kind of just a, a a small thing that could potentially cause issues down the road. You just want to make sure that you pay attention to that. Lastly, yeah, suspensions. The great thing about suspensions is if you can if you can see it in the pictures, essentially that allows for movement itself. Whereas, you know, if I go back, these supports, they're bolted, those are not moving at all. Once that's in there, it's in there. The suspensions allow for movement back and forth. And what that does that if you've got an uneven load between two spans, that just allows for the cable to move back and forth and essentially self-adjust, if you want to call it just to help relieve some of that difference in load between the two sides. Again, the downside though is, you know, if we're talking about a fiber to the home deployment, yeah, there's a good chance you may want to be able to go back and add another cable. You don't really have that option here. Essentially, you'd have to add some, you know, another cable above or below it. And then again, you know, that's when we start getting into, you know, moving the neutral zone and, and affecting uh, those zones in terms of NESC, re NESC requirements. So something to keep in mind. Now, a couple different accessories that we want to look at. And first, I would say this is probably uh, the, a very necessary product. It's called a dielectric damper. So what this is going to do is this is going to help protect your hardware that can be caused by Aeolian vibration. What that is, is it's a very high frequency vibration that's in, caused in the cable or that is, uh, that is caused in the cable as a result of a sustained wind, wind across the cable. So think of a, you know, a guitar string. You pluck a guitar string and it's barely moving in terms of the range of the motion, but it's vibrating very quickly. That vibration could in turn damage the hardware. You damage the hardware, you damage the cable, it's more money out of the pocket. The great, things, the great thing about these dampers though, is they're easy to install, they don't require tools, and it's a very cheap product. Um, so it's just one of those, you know, you spend the little bit extra to go ahead and put this in your network, put this on your cable, and it's going to, it's going to be well worth it from a financial perspective down the road. Next, we've got what's called an airflow spoiler. So whereas the, the last one, it was more of a, a high frequency, low movement situation, again, like a, a guitar string that's vibrating. This is going to help combat the damage on the hardware that's caused by galloping. 
So what we're going to see here is in, in you know, colder conditions up in you know, the northwest Canada, um, you know, the northeast, when you get ice that accumulates on the cable, the ice is going to form a you know, call it a teardrop shape, which is going to be very similar to the shape of an airplane wing. Well, so you add take that shape and then add a high wind, it will actually lift the cable up to a point to where it can no longer sustain and it drops. So again, yeah, a much larger movement in the cable. So what this is going to do, it's actually going to change the air profile of the cable so that when you get those high winds, you know, the cable doesn't lift because of the, you know, the effect of the shape of the ice that's formed around it. Now, again, yeah, this isn't going to be something like the last one that everybody's going to use. Um, honestly, if if you need it, you probably already know that you do. Um, so again, you know, there's probably some areas out there where, you know, maybe you don't get that much ice, but you do, you know, once every five years, once every six years could be something that you potentially want to look at. And now this, too, is going to be designed based on the outside diameter of your cable. Now, again, yeah, in terms of talking ADSS engineering, there is way more that goes into it. Um, there's uh, just a lot of ins and outs. Uh, Mike Riddle, our executive VP, did a, a, an ADSS engineering 101 a while back. You can go to our website and watch it. When you get emailed this presentation, you can click the link here to watch it. But he'll also be doing an encore performance of that presentation next month as well. So feel free to check it out. He'll be able to dive into, into this a whole lot more. All right, next, looking at a, you know, what everybody calls strand and lash, right? This is going to be the cable that's in the comm zone. Again, you know, this is going to be the approach that's going to be a lot more common with your traditional telephone companies, your rural telephone cooperatives, because again, they can't get up into that distribution supply region, so they've got to stay down in the comm zone. So the good thing about this, though, is you do have the ability to use armored cable, which does help out a bit more with shotgun damage, with squirrel damage. Um, but the thing is, is now, again, because you still are up in the pole and you've got a conductor, you've got to make sure that you stay on top of grounding because you can run into issues both with your the lashing wire and the messenger, but also the armor and the cable. The armor and the cable, you can run into issues um, with you know, conducting. Actually, that end up conducting some type of electricity. Um, so you just want to stay on top of that. From a growth standpoint, though, it's really good because you can just overlash. If you need to run another cable, you just overlash it. So you have a bit more flexibility there uh, in some instances when it comes to growth or being able to add a second cable. And then lastly, being able to use a telco crew. Again, you're below the neutral. You can go find any telco crew. They can get up and they can work here. Now, the largest downside of this is the make ready cost. Um, and I've got here that, you know, that potentially could be looking at make ready costs high as fifty thousand dollars per mile about three weeks ago i was having a discussion with uh, an engineering firm that also does fiber the home builds as well and they had an instance where they actually had areas where the make ready was seventy five thousand dollars a mile so that means you're spending seventy five thousand dollars a mile before you've even strung one strand of fiber so yeah if we go with that you know that extreme scenario if you've got 50 miles in your plant that needs to be changed to accept this cable, you're talking about three and three quarters of a million dollars that you're going to spend before you've even strung up one single fiber optic cable. And the reason I bring that up is, you know, obviously there's a lot of funding going on out there right now, um, you know, especially in the United States with RDOF and all these different things. You know, you've got a single pot of money that you've got to pull funds from, and you want to be able to use that money to get in front of as many customers as possible. But when you're talking about spending millions of dollars before you can even start deploying cable, you know, you're greatly changing your cost per homes passed on that bill. The other thing is, too, is from a maintenance standpoint, you've got a lot higher maintenance costs involved because yeah, I think we've probably all seen like in this picture here, You've all, everybody's driven down the road. You've seen the broken lashing wire. That cable's hanging down. It's just, it's ugly. It doesn't look good. And, you know, it's one of the things that just, it happens. So you've got to constantly go back, fix that broken lashing wire. And just that, all that is just added money going in there. And then lastly, again, if, it, you know, if, and this from a utility standpoint, if you're the utility, 
you're still competing with space with the other telcos down there. Now, as we look at splice enclosures and, and what we're going to use in these different situations, the thing I like about using ADSS, and again, yeah, as a utility, you own the pole. So what you can do here is you can actually bring the splice enclosure down below the comm area and mount that splice enclosure with slack cable or cable slack on the pole itself. That does a couple of things. It now allows you to be able to go higher or to use a strict telco crew to go get that enclosure and bring it down because now you're not getting up into this into the power space. So now they can go up even just using a ladder. They can go up, grab the enclosure, take the take the extra fiber down, go into their splice trailer, do their thing, and put it back up. The downside is those, you know, depending on where the cable is, or excuse me, the cable where the pole is, yeah, you know, it might be a pole that you can't reach with a bucket truck. So now if your guys go out and climb it, you know, depending on what type of bracket you use and how you put it on there, that could present an obstacle for the power crew that's trying to get up and actually do work in the power space. Now we look at, you know, the other option is mounting on the cable. You can do it with both ADSS and with strand and lash. This will be the only way that you're going to do it in a strand and lash application. Now, from that standpoint, you've got a couple routes you can go. You can go with a butt splice enclosure and mix that with with a horseshoe um, and then you know, go up, bring that down that way. You can also go with some inline enclosures as well, which have a lot of really great benefits with a fiber to the home deployment. So again, just one of those things that really just kind of depends on, on what you want out of it. Now, in the case of ADSS with a cable mounted enclosure, a couple things to think of. One, it's yeah, it's definitely going to be way more cumbersome to bring that enclosure down from up there than it would be a pole mount enclosure. The other thing is too, is you're adding weight to that cable. So remember our ADSS cable and our hardware, it's all based off of preset predetermined criteria. So if you go and you add weight to that cable, you know, potentially you could make it that if there is a, an ice load on that cable, it could bring that load out of spec. Um, how much, you know, you know, that's it's, it's tough to say, but it's something you at least want to keep in mind if you do want to go that route with ADSS cable. And again, yeah, I spoke on damage. Uh, so surprisingly enough, squirrels and gunshot damage, the two most, uh, or I guess, you know, the causes, two highest causes of damage with fiber optic cable, lightning and fire, not far behind. Um, the thing with your ADSS cable is lightning is not really going to get to it, but the thing is, is you know, especially when we see it out west all the time, and you know, and going on right now in the out west, the Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, forest fires are absolutely just going wild. Um, that's going to damage a lot of cable. There are different options out there. Yeah, in cab, we manufacture a fire resistant cable. Um, we also have what we call our Defender ADSS cable. It's a, a rodent resistant ADSS cable. So we use a mixture of an additive and the outer jacket, you know, call it like a, a hot sauce, right? It's gonna be spicy to the taste of, a, of the rodents. But if they do get past that, you've got FRP rods that we use instead of aramid yarn. And if they get past the outer jacket, that's going to stop them. And then we combine that with a double jacketed design. So now if the rodents do get to, you know, if they get through that outer jacket into the FRP rod, your core is still protected from water intrusion. So again, just, uh, you know, uh, there's a thousand decisions you're gonna have to make in your fiber to the home build. Um, you know, uh, this is just another one of those decisions that probably doesn't get brought up a ton, but it's definitely a, a, a great thing to look at if you feel like you're gonna have those issues down the road. And just some neat pictures of, of testing that we've actually done um, in the field. And you can see, you know, this picture on the left, all the way over on the right, you've got your FRP rods, and they stopped there. All right, so moving to underground. Uh, yeah, the big thing, at least the big pro for underground cables is just from a, an aesthetic standpoint, it's way cleaner, right? It's out of sight, out of mind. You do have a lower chance for squirrels getting into it um, and damaging the cables. Obviously, in a, in a vault or a handhold like this, you still can see that in there. The other great thing about it is in new builds, and especially in a, a brand new subdivision that's getting built, you can joint trench as well. So while those trenches are getting dug up and, and all the utilities are getting put in, you can go join in 
have your install done just helps reduce cost a little bit. Now, while on one, one end, you are protected from harsh weather, right? Tornadoes, heavy winds, things like that. However, you're going to run into a lot of issues with people digging up the cable. Um, you know, if we, if we have the term on here, there's more backhoes than tornadoes. That's just a, a fact of life of dealing with cable that's below ground. Also, the, you know, the installation cost is going to be much higher, but you're also going to deal with shorter cut links. So shorter cut links, more splicing, more money. You've got the right of way easement concerns to keep in mind. Uh, you know, different states have have different policies with going down the right of way. Some states you have to go through the DOT or you have to use DOT approved material to be able to be in the right of way. Some states you don't have to be, you're, you don't have to use DOT approved material. Again, it's just, it's going to differ everywhere. Um, lastly, the vaults can, especially depending on your area, can fill with water, which does give you the potential for getting a flooded splice enclosure. Now, here's the thing. All the major companies that make splice enclosures make a great enclosure. They're airtight, watertight. However, that's assuming that it's you know, not late on a Friday afternoon or in the middle of the night after a cut and the contractor, the splicer is trying to put this thing together and get out. Um, you know, human error happens. So again, it's you know, just another thing to, to keep in mind. And then lastly, the terrain can make the cost vary greatly. You, know, you start hitting rocky terrain and you're gonna see your, your cost of installation absolutely skyrocket. Now there's typically, you're gonna be two main different ways to put this cable underground. Direct bury is gonna be one of the more common because it's a lower overall cost. You've got multiple options for armored cable uh, and especially in a rural setting, you can a lot of times just plow down the side of the road and, you know, and you're not really damaging anybody's front yard. So in rural settings, that's going to be very popular. However, just like in a strain and lash application, you're going to make sure you keep up with grounding because you still do have the potential to carry voltage back to the electronics. The other plus side of going direct barry is you can use that armor for a cable location. If we move into the conduit, you can technically run armored cable in the conduit, but you know if not, you don't have to deal with the grounding. You know, of course, now if you're just gonna buy a conduit that has a tracer tape that you can use for locating, you are gonna have a higher overall cost going with cable and conduit. But one thing I do like, and again, from a utility standpoint, if you're running ADSS cable, to me, it makes sense to go ahead and, and use interduct because now you can come right off the pole, go below grade into your conduit, and you're not having to change what type of cable you're using. So just from a warehousing and an ordering standpoint, just makes it a lot easier. Secondly, if you're installing duct, it makes sense to go ahead and drop a couple extra ducts in at the same time. Whether or not you want to use a micro duct and a micro cable, this gives you, you know, I call it future proofing from being able to grow your network, add cable, or if you want an extra stream of revenue, you lease out that conduit or you pull cable through and you lease out, lease out fibers, dark fibers on that as well. So again, you know, uh, everything comes back to how you can maximize or, you know, how you can minimize your cost and maximize your revenue. Now we got to go on to the enclosures. Do we want to go for underground cables? Do we want to go with a, an above ground level enclosure like a pedestal that's pictured here or drop an enclosure into a handhold? A lot of times what you're going to see in rural areas is you're going to stick with more of the pedestal design because you're driving down the road. It's going to be a whole lot easier to visually visually locate the pedestals versus a, a handhold and a splice enclosure that's below grade. Especially when you think about you know rural America, you're going to have growth. You're going to have weeds and grass that's going to grow. And it can essentially cover up a handhold. The downside is their pedestals are going to be a lot more susceptible to damage. Lawn mowers, uh, you know, cars pulling off on the side of the road and parking, or you know, literally just a bored kid with a baseball bat. Um, you know, cost-wise, their you know pedestals are typically going to be looked at as being a cheaper option. But depending on what you go with and, and how robust you want to go in your network. You know, just from a, a product standpoint, it really can go either way. Uh, just a couple quick outside the box solutions. Uh, you know, we talked about a lot about armored cable. What's going to be most common is a corrugated steel tape. Uh, we do also offer a round wire armor. It's going to provide way more protection than standard corrugated steel tape. Not super popular in the US yet, uh, but there have definitely been applications where we've seen that used. 
We also offer a dielectric FRP armor. So now with this, you're staying in a dielectric cable, but you're uh, you're still giving yourself a little bit extra extra protection. And then we yeah we talked about doing armored cable and conduit. Yeah, again, just make sure you keep up with the grounding there. Uh, and then lastly, using an optical neutral or an optical messenger. Essentially, just think of your messenger wire in a strand lash situation and put fiber inside of that. Um, and so again, this is something we haven't really seen, but you know, we like to just kind of look at some different ways and, and different ways to, you know, that could potentially work out in your benefit down the road. Next, we're going to look at two of the main GPON architectures. So when I say GPON, it's a gigabit passive optical network. So all we're saying here is we're taking, you know, if you take a single fiber that's leaving your central office, we are going to split the light multiple ways to feed our customers. Your most common split ratio is one by 16 and one by 32. So all that means is for every single lit fiber, we're going to feed either 16 or 32 customers. And now that number has gone up to you know, 64 and yeah, that continues to grow as, as technology improves. But still one by 16, one by 32 is going to be your most common. Centralized split. Simply put, and we're going to locate splitters all in a central location. Uh, so in the case of you look on the right, there's a 288 fiber distribution hub or an FDH. That two, what that 288 means, I'm going to feed 288 customers out of that cabinet. And then all the splitters are going to get installed installed in that cabinet. And now you, you can get these cabinets going from a 96 up to a 576. And essentially, you know, as you get new customers on your network, you'll take the take the leads off the splitter plug it into the corresponding port. And then from there, it's point to point from the cabinet to the customer. It's it's a it's a, a, yeah, a very easy design. It's this the design that's been used for a long time, very common, very easy to design. But the thing is, is there's a high cost associated with the use of an FDH and both you know, material and splicing. I mean, essentially you could sink over $20,000 just into this location before you've connected a, a single household. So again, we just look at the design itself. Again, we've got a, a 24 fiber that's going to feed the cabinet. And then a 288 cabinet, you're going to have nine splitters. And then the most common thing to leave that cabinet with is going to be two 144 fiber cables. And then again, from there, it's point to point. It's leaving the cable, leaving the, the cabinet and going to the house. And typically what you're going to see is the further away from the cabinet you get, you're going to drop down or you're going to taper down to smaller cable counts. So what that also is going to mean, what that also means is you are going to have multiple cable sizes and multiple splice enclosure sizes. So just again, just you know, looking at the warehousing standpoint of it, this is going to give you more material to use. Lastly, when we look at splicing, with this type of a setup, you're looking at roughly three and a quarter splices for every home that you passed. And we'll come back to that number here in a minute. So next, looking at a distributed split architecture. So what we're going to do here is we're basically going to get rid of that FDH and we're going to move the splitters out into the field and put them in splice enclosure. So you can see this enclosure here, you've got your small splitter in there. And then what we're going to do is use different combinations of splitters to achieve our 1 by 16 and 1 by 32 split ratios. So for a 1 by 16 split ratio, it can be a 1 by 4 to 1 by 4. Or we can do a one by four to a one by eight, right? Four times eight, is thirty-two. So it, you can it's, it's very customizable in terms of how you're going to deploy. But now what we're going to do is that twenty-four fiber feeder that was feeding that cabinet. Again, we got rid of the cabinet, so now we're going to continue with that twenty-four. You know, or in your case, it might be a thirty-six or a forty-eight. But we're going to stick that twenty-four cap that twenty-four fiber. And that is now going to run through the rest of our distribution area. And other, again, the other big thing about this is it's also going to reduce splicing a lot. And that's going to be a big money saver in your network. So when I talk about using you know, one by four to one by eight. You know, a great thing to do here is what's called yeah, you know, what I call reusing fibers. So we're going to look at our primary splice enclosure right here. So again, I've got my 24 fiber input that was feeding that 288 cabinet. Our blue fiber is going to feed a one by four splitter. The first leg off that one by four splitter is going to feed a one by eight splitter. 
So now we've got coming out of that one by eight, we have our one by 32 split ratio. So those eight leads are going to feed customers. Now what we're going to do though is we're going to take the second, third, and fourth lead off of that one by four splitter. And we're going to splice those back into our violet rose and aqua fiber. And then we're just going to continue down the road. In our secondary splice enclosure, now we're going to break out our violet fiber because remember that's already been split four ways. And then in this enclosure, we're going to have another one by eight. Those eight fibers have now all been split in a one by 32 ratio. Connect your customers. And then from there, it's essentially wash, rinse, repeat. So again, we've got our backbone, our 24 fiber breaking off of that backbone, and we're using that same 24 fiber throughout connecting all of our customers. So you got your primary enclosure with your one by four and one by eight, and then you got three secondary enclosures with just a one by eight. And then again, from there, you just start over, wash, rinse, repeat. And just to, and, and we stuck with this, I wanted to keep with the same 288 customers served. So I'm still serving the exact same amount of customers, but I've lowered my cable count. I've lowered the size of my splice enclosures and I've dropped our splicing per homes pass down to almost a third of a splice per homes pass. So again, you know, if we wanna call it, you know, call it roughly three splices per home, that I'm eliminating at a you know, call it average of $25 per splice, I'm saving $75 for every house that I pass in the network. And I'm not even talking about the, the cost of the material. And it's, you know, it's things like this. If you start cutting back on the splicing and, and the construction, that's where you are going to save the money in your build overall. Now, however, that's not to say that centralized split doesn't have its place, that it doesn't come with some, some good positives. Again, centralized split has been around for a long time. People know how to build that way. Yeah, again, it's, it's point to point, essentially. So record keeping is, is much simpler than distributed split. Because again, distributed split, you're going to have multiple splitters inside enclosures that are going to be much more spread out. Now, if you're a utility and you're starting from scratch, you know, it, one utilities, they already, you guys do a great job at record keeping anyways, right? Just because of your electric plant, but also you're starting from scratch. So you can go ahead and set those standards and set how you want to track that record, track those records and how you want to map out the network as well. Um, so again, it's, it's well as it really just kind of depends on your situation. Um, for example, I know a customer, they're building all centralized split and they said, look, Tim, we understand the cost. That's what we understand, and we've got the money for it. So we're good. So again, it's it's not a right or a wrong. It's one of those things that there's, you know, there's a lot more that goes on to it, you know, other than just how much it costs or, you know, hey, well, this is what this guy knows how to do. So so we're going to run with it. Lastly, we'll look at service drop cable options. Um, you know, really your most common drop cable is going to be a flat drop cable you know really the, the great thing about a flat drop cable is it's a pretty robust cable for a dielectric you know really a non-armored cable it's got some pretty good strength to it and so that's really what makes it one of the you know more common and popular cable options for running drops to the house uh, it's also a very low cost cable as well um, so, you know, it's, it's easy to access, it's easy to get into. So, you know, for the sake of, you know, if we're hiring an entry level splicer to come out and just connect customers, you, know, you can teach that, that, that guy or that, that woman, you can teach them how to get into that cable very easily, get the customer connected, you're good to go. Round drop cables definitely have a good spot depending on your, your particular application. You know, or do we have a, a span that we're going from a pole to a house that's longer than you know the 250, 300 feet that a standard drop cable can can typically handle, right? So you can either go with a a round drop cable that's got airman yarn in it to give it that extra strength. You can go with a a figure eight cable that's you know essentially a flat drop cable with an extra FRP rod connected to it for added strength. So you know it's you really want to look at what your particular network holds. 
Now, lastly, and yeah, this might create a controversy of opinions with some people. What gets sold a lot is your pre-connectorized, your hardened pre-connectorized drop terminals, right? So by that, what I mean, it's a, you know, you will buy a terminal that might have four, six, or eight ports on it. And then from there, you know, let's say in case of an above ground application, that's going to mount to the pole. From there, you're going to have a drop terminal that at one end has a connector that will plug straight into that terminal. That cable is going to be cut to length. So you're going to have a 50 foot, 100 foot, 200 foot, 250, all the way up to 1500 feet. But when we're talking about a rural setting, I mean, how many times is the house 50 feet off the road? So what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up having to stock yeah, 10 plus different lengths of cable to match what the houses in your area are. And, you know, and we all know how that's going to end. It's going to be Friday afternoon at four o'clock. Your install tech is going to get you know, one last call. Hey, yeah, we need you out at 125 Main Street. He gets out there. The house is 100 feet off the road and he's got a thousand foot drop cable and that's all he's got. But we all know what's happening is that thousand foot drop cable is either going to get cut and he's going to splice it on or he's just going to hang up that thousand foot just coiled up on that pole and hope nobody comes back and notices because he's not going to go back on Monday and, and replace it. So just you know, from a, a warehousing and material standpoint, it can be you know, a pain to keep up with. Now, if you're in a very densely populated area and, you know, and you've got, let's say, you know, neighborhoods and I use the Dallas Fort Worth area uh you know if you're flying into Dallas you look down you see neighborhoods that are thousands of homes it seems like now all those homes are typically going to be the same length off of the side off of the sidewalk off of the road so yeah, if you're gonna have technicians in and out of that place every single day connecting and disconnecting customers that option might make sense the other thing to keep in mind though is from the numbers that I've, I've seen and talking to people if you go with a pre-connectorized solution, you could be adding $75 per homes passed just in material. Now, one thing that I've seen a lot of customers go with, and that's given them a good mix of, of having a connectorized drop without having to pay the extra money, is doing something like what we've got with this picture on the bottom, where you've got an SEAPC adapter right in the enclosure. So then what you can do is on the initial install, install, you go ahead and on the construction side, set up your adapter array to feed particular customers. And then the thing is with technology the way it is and splicers the way it is, you can easily train a young technician how to splice on an SEAPC SC, adapter. So now he can go into that enclosure, he can splice on his adapter, plug it in. Now you're still a pluggable solution that gives you a test point. But now your splice tech or your drop tech, he's carrying around a bulk reel with 10,000 feet of fiber optic cable on it. And he's going to use that the entire time. Uh, so uh, yeah, again, in certain settings and the, the, the argument for the, the drop terminals, you know, these pre-connectorized drop terminals is, uh, well, yeah, it keeps you from having to, you know, splice anything drop cables get cut all the time you're going to need guys that can splice so you know long term you know i just i haven't really seen a in a rural setting haven't seen anything that that really lends the fact that the added material cost can make up for the labor cost of, of paying a, an entry level splicer to put on an SCAPC connector and plug it in again you know it's all about what you want to do so one last quick thing, and this will be on the the presentation when it gets emailed out to everybody. Um, you know, we offer cables for an entire fiber to home solution, going from your backbone all the way to your in, uh, indoor distribution and riser solutions as well. Uh, all this information will be on the presentation when it gets emailed out to you. So a few final thoughts. Uh, yeah, again, there's no one size fits all approach to building fiber to the home. There just isn't. Every network is going to be different. Every situation is different, right? And as much as, again, yeah, I mentioned the customer that's building an, a large network with all centralized split, that's what works for them. 
but there's other customers that are doing many different versions of a distributed split. It's what they want, it's what worked for them. So, you know, I just, I, and I say that because, if, you know, especially when you look at these rural electric cooperatives and municipalities that are looking at doing fiber to the home, you know, this is all very new to them. So for what you don't want is you don't want somebody to come in and say, oh yeah, hey, we're going to build it this way. And, you know, this way is going to work for you the same way it worked for 25 other, other customers that we build fiber to the home for. Because you know you might be an electric cooperative that's yeah in a major metropolitan area with 220,000 electric subscribers, you may not want to build the same way that a rural electric cooperative in the middle of Arkansas with 15,000 customers might build. And I think the best thing that you can do is just educate yourself on you know on what the different options are, right? If if you have a consultant come in and say, hey, you know we're going to do it this way we are going to use this material we're going to do it this way make sure they can explain to you why you know why are you doing it this way and not that way you know what what if we went with this type of enclosure versus this type of enclosure because the thing is is these the consultants these engineering firms they're going to come in they're going to build your your network and in four or five years when they're done they're gone and now it's going to be up to you to maintain the network, to continue to grow your network. So the last thing that you want to do is get stuck to where you know you're two years into a fiber to the home build, or you know you're at the end of it, and now you've learned a little bit more, and you sit back and look and say, "Man, I yeah, you know, I really wish we would have done X or whatever that might be." So again, I just I implore you as much as possible, do research. Again, yeah. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of decisions that you'll have to make and it may seem easy to you know a good way to let somebody just you know hey we'll push the easy button we'll take care of everything for you but i can't employ you enough to just do some research reach out to other utilities that have deployed fiber to them you know reach out to municipalities reach out to telcos as well say hey yeah how did you guys do this because especially in the utility space you know again you know a lot of these guys they started out brand new they had hiccups, yeah. You know, they've had to change companies, they've had to change the way that they built, you know, if they've dealt with those headaches. And most of them that I've talked to, they're happy to share. So just get out and do that. Talk to other people, you know, find out what will work best for you and your build. And you know, and again, you know, talk about your bucket of money. Because again, at the end of the day, you want to be able to maximize how far that money is going to get you. The last thing, and especially from a material standpoint, please, please, please don't buy anything proprietary from an outside plant standpoint. <coughs> Excuse me. The main reason is once you go to proprietary material, you are at the mercy of the manufacturer. The manufacturer comes back in a year and says, hey, Sorry, you know, prices went up 35%, you're stuck. If you have a storm comes through and it damages something and you need, you know, you need material next week, if their lead times are at 12 weeks or 16 weeks or whatever it is, you're stuck and you can't use anything else. So what's going to end up happening is you're going to end up having to pull all that material out of the air, out of the ground or whatever it is, and you're going to go replace it with something else. If there are enough options you know, and I'm talking everything outside plant, not even just cable. There are enough options from an outside plant standpoint that you can find something that's super high quality, makes sense from a call standpoint, that's going to work for you in a in a way that, again, you know, should something happen two, three years down the road, even if you like what you're using, you'll still be able to go find something else that can work, you know, in a hurry or because a distributor has this in stock and you've got to have it. You just want to make sure that you keep your options open from that standpoint. And again, you know, feel free to use this as, as a resource. I've been in the industry for a while. You know, I know a lot of these utilities that have built and, and are building. I, I know multiple engineering firms, consulting firms that are, you know, that would be happy to come in and just talk to your group and say, hey, you know, here's here's what we've seen. Here's the pros and cons of each. So with that said, um, that's that's gonna wrap it up for uh for this. Um thank you for everybody that's uh that came out. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that uh, 
you know, you learned a thing or two. And yeah, I think that the big thing for me and yeah, and being in this industry is I'm, you know, I'm always learning. I'm happy to learn. Uh, so if you've got questions or if, if you have a different take on, yeah, you know, any of any of the things that I've shared, I'd love to have a discussion with you and, you know, and, and see what your take is and hear what your experience is. Yeah, you know, I'd love to love to help out any way I can. And uh, I'd also just love to, yeah, you know, love to learn a, a different stand, yeah, you know, different view or a different standpoint or anything I can from anybody else. So that's it. 